Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to 2013 and welcome to episode, I think it's 89 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next eh, about half hour, I'm going to be uh, your rancher and raconteur, as always, uh, talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, any comments, questions, reactions, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, you can uh, go to my website, which is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and that'll be up around here somewhere a couple of times during the show. And you can get the email address from there. Uh, as always, again, uh, if you uh, do send me email, please include something like left side of the aisle or, or your cable show or something like that in the show so that I know it's not spam. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is I'm actually going to start with a uh, couple of things. Uh, I always like to, when I can, to be able to start with some good news. So first, there are sort of three connected bits of good news on one of the few topics where there seems to be a fair bit of good news uh, these days, and that is the area of same-sex marriage. Uh, just after midnight on December 9th, Emily and Sarah Kofer were married in the chambers of a judge in Seattle, Washington. Uh, they were the first to be married under Washington's new law allowing for same-sex marriage, and about 200 such marriages were performed across the state on that same day. Now, more recently, on Saturday, December 29th, it was Stephen Bridges and Michael Snell who became the first to uh, uh, be married, first same-sex couple to be married in the state of Maine. And um, James Scales and William Tasker got married just after midnight on New Year's Day. Uh, when Maryland became the first state south of the, south of the Mason-Dixon line to recognize same-sex marriages. Nine states and the District of Columbia now have approved same-sex marriage. It will take time to undo the damage that was done by the fundies um, who have confused, frightened, and stampeded people into approving bans in state constitutions on same-sex marriage in a number of states. But I say now with increasing confidence that that day will come. That day of justice will come. And there will come a time, fairly soon, uh, when the idea of a same-sex couple won't seem any stranger than any other kind. And that is good news. Now, the other bit of good news comes from a source that has not usually been a source of good news recently. Usually it's been a source of bad news or clownishness, and that's the United States Supreme Court. Uh, the new health care law, now that's this, you know, this inadequate pastiche of things that will, yes, it will help some people, but will actually set the cause of truly universal access to health care back by a couple of decades or more. But um, the new law includes a provision that requires employees to provide contraceptive care as part of the health care package offered to employees. <laughs> now, bear in mind that the controversy about, uh, and that still seems strange to say. It really does. It, seem, it boggles my mind that the idea of contraceptive care can be controversial now. I mean, Margaret Sanger must be turning over in her grave, and poor Bill Baird must be in complete despair at this point. Anyway, bear in mind that the controversy about this provision led to a compromise under which employers are not bearing the cost of the contraceptive care. But, of course, that doesn't matter to the right-wing wackos and the pseudo-Christian fundamentalists. They've been trying to get this provision banned entirely, kicked out entirely, because they claim it's a violation of their religious freedom. The freedom apparently being that to impose their beliefs on their employees. There are two businesses who are challenging the act in federal court. Uh, it's a, together. Uh, one is a nationwide chain of stores called Hobby Lobby, and the other is Mardell, which is a chain of Christian bookstores. Uh, and they asked the Supreme Court to issue a temporary stay against the law, which went into effect on January 1st. Well, on uh, last Wednesday, December 26th, the Supreme Court refused to issue that injunction. And that, frankly, is good news. It's a small bit of good news. And I suppose, in a way, it's negative good news in that it's about something that wasn't done rather than something that was. But still, these days, you're going to take what good news you can get. You know, and the thing is, what's amazing is how much of the 
freakouts among the right wing, how much of their outrage is devoted to topics that in some way involve sex or sexuality. Um, I mean, even in the case of same-sex marriage, you know, no matter how much they blather about the Bible or God's word or God intended this or whatnot, you can't escape the fact that a lot of the opposition lies in the fact that these people find the thought of gays and lesbians having sex as just the technical term is icky. I really think that there will be a lot less opposition to same-sex marriage if somehow it could be assured that these same-sex couples would remain celibate the rest of their lives. But it's not just that. It's not just same-sex mar same marriage. All the things that appear to really get the, um, oh, the holy roller juices going uh, seem to revolve somehow around sex, uh, particularly women's sexuality, which includes things like um, abortion and birth control both of which involve women having greater aut autonomy, greater control over their own sex lives. I mean, face facts, though, folks. The, the battle over contraceptive care is not about condoms. Now, years ago, people were warning us that the assault on abortion rights was merely a prelude, and any successes there would only lead the same fanatics to seek controls on birth control. Now, to many, that seemed like a ridiculous notion. It seemed like the, the idea of birth control was so well established that it was like immune to attack. But the ongoing assaults on the nation's largest provider of family planning services, that being Planned Parenthood, that shows that these warnings were spot on. The latest attack comes in Texas. A state judge ruled on December 31st that the state can go ahead and cut off funding to Planned Parenthood, uh, the Planned Parenthood's health care programs for poor women. See, last year, the Texas state legislature passed this law that said uh, you could strip away state funding from any affiliate of a provider of abortion services, affiliate being defined as groups that supported abortion rights. In other words, you don't actually have to provide abortions. You don't have to have anything to do actually with abortions. You merely have to advocate that women should have the access to abortions to run afoul of this bit of backwater brain rot. Planned Parenthood of Texas have been receiving funds from the state uh, as reimbursement for its costs of providing basic health care for poor women. In fact, they covered nearly half of the 110,000 poor women who were uh, covered under the state's women's health program. Now, this law would cut off those funds, would cut off those funds. Planned Parenthood is sued, claiming this violates the constitutional rights of both patients and doctors. And as part of that, it sought an injunction against that law going into effect. Now, however, state judge, his name is Gary Harger, has denied that motion, finding that Texas may exclude otherwise qualified doctors and clinics from receiving state funding if they advocate for abortion rights. Apparently, the idea of freedom of speech has yet to penetrate the borders of the great state of Texas. The suit will go forward, but the ban on funding, at least for now, goes into effect. Governor Rick Perry claimed that the ruling, quoting him, finally clears the way for thousands of low-income Texas women to access much-needed care. I'm not sure what way is being cleared for the 48,000 poor women who now have to scramble to find new doctors and clinics in a state that already has a shortage of primary care physicians willing to accept such patients. But then again, we are dealing with a man whose hair has a higher IQ than he does. Now, as a quick footnote to this, in May 2011, Indiana became the first state to deny Planned Parenthood Medicaid funding because it provided uh, uh, for general health services, including cancer screening, because it also provided abortion services, even though they weren't funded by Medicaid. In June 2011, a federal district court issued an injunction against the law saying Indiana did not have the authority to exclude otherwise qualified recipients from Medicaid, and that the law violated patients' rights to have the doctor of their choosing. That injunction was upheld last October by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals so that there is, in fact, some reason to believe that uh, 
what Texas has done, well, ultimately, it may not stand. Uh, all right, from there, we're going on to uh, this week's, um, uh, one, of the, one of our regular features, the, uh, the Clown Award. The Clown Award. This week's dishonoree is one Irving Pinsky. He's a lawyer in New Haven, Connecticut, representing the parents of an unnamed six-year-old survivor of the Newtown uh, school massacre. In a filing the last week of December, he claimed that the girl, who was referred only to as Jill Doe in the filing, heard some of the violence over the school's intercom system and sustained, quoting the, the filing, emotional and psychological trauma and injury, the nature and extent of which are yet to be determined. He wanted to sue the state of Connecticut for $100 million. Now, he dropped his claim a couple of days later because he said he was evaluating new evidence. Now, apart from the fact that, uh, you know, you're saying that uh, she was harmed, but you can't say how or how badly, uh, this would seem to prov uh, require some new evidence. But I really suspect that the new evidence he was considering was the local reaction to his filing in a town still in mourning and whose parents are burying their children. But he, didn't, he said he would not rule out, he would not rule out um, future legal activity, future legal action. But he said, you know, it's, it's okay, don't worry about this. It, it's really, it's, it's only because he said, it's not about the money. He said it was never about the money. It was about improving school security. No, it was about the money. It was about the money. Irving Pinsky and the parents who hired you, you are all clowns. We're going to take a break. And here we are back again, as always. Uh, so, you heard about the deal. Yes, you've heard about the deal. Uh, I'm doing this on Wednesday afternoon, and of course, this was just done last night, uh, Tuesday night. The deal, the way we avoided stepping off the, fi uh, the fiscal curb, excuse me, cliff. Uh, it was all last minute drama, all breathless rumors and reports. The heroine's tied to the railroad tracks, and the train is coming, and the hero's on his trusty steed, and when he gets to her in time, and so forth and so on. The media loves this stuff. They really do. They love dwelling on importance and possibilities because that's more fun than trying to do the really boring hard work of trying to figure out what it actually means. But in any event, it was done. It was done. The Senate passed its measure at 2 a.m. on New Year's Day, and the House, after some rumblings of rebellions from the more foaming-at-the-mouth members of the Copper Caucus, um, they passed their own version just before 11 p.m. that same day, with, in fact, Democrats providing most of the support because a majority of the Goppers actually voted against the thing. But anyway, so it's done. What is? I'm not going to go through all the details of what was passed, uh, um, but these, these are the major points. Okay, first on taxes. Permanently raises tax rates to 39.6% on incomes over $400,000 for individuals and $450,000 for couples filing jointly. Raises taxes on capital gains and dividends for those same households from the current 15% to just under 20%. It reinstates a limit on the value of personal exemptions uh, as well as the value of itemized deductions that high-income earners can take. It uh, set the, uh, the tax rate on estates at 40% on estates over $5 million, which is a, so, uh, something of an increase from the current 35% on estates over $5.12 million. Uh, and it continues tax breaks for middle and lower income folks, such as the earned income tax credit and the child care tax credit. And it also allowed the payroll tax holiday to expire. A couple of other matters that were of some importance. It continued extended unemployment benefits. That was a big one as far as I was concerned. It delayed for two months part of the $110 billion in spending cuts that were otherwise supposed to come uh, early in January. Uh, $24 billion in cuts, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in cuts uh, were made to defray the cost of putting that uh, thing off for two months. Half of those cuts came from the, from the military spending and half from domestic spending. Uh, 
All right, now there's more to it than that. There are a lot of little details and things, some good, some bad. But I'm going to skip those for now because you can get all of the details. You can get them in from newspapers or TV or blogs or, or, or online news sources. Lots of places you can get all those details. I'm more concerned with, as I said earlier, what does this mean? Now, the White House issued a statement uh, that was like lavish with self-praise. It included the unintentionally amusing statement, quoting, referring to Obama, in 2012, he kept his promise of asking the wealthiest 2% of Americans to pay more. Except, of course, his promise was that he absolutely positively would not accept any continuation of those tax cuts for people making over $250,000 a year for couples. Uh, now it's $450,000 a year for couples. And the changes would produce over the next 10 years $620 billion in new tax revenue, which was like half of what they were originally looking for. But here's something more important, and this is uh, something really important that has not gotten enough consideration. Federal government spending today is around 23% of the gross domestic product, the size of our economy. Now, that, that figure is not particularly high, either by historical standards or in comparison to other industrialized nations. In fact, here's, here's something, here's a map that can show you. Uh, even total government spending, so total government spending at all levels in the United States is not high compared to other industrialized nations. And this is a map of Europe, and the various color codings are what portion of the gross domestic product is represented by government spending. Right in the middle there, Switzerland in blue, that is the only nation in Europe whose government spending is a smaller portion of their economy than that of the United States. So the figures that we have are not particularly high. But here's another way of looking at that. Here's this other graph. There's another way of looking at this. This shows the 20 largest uh, economies, uh, and the chart shows their spending per capita on their citizens. So the further up you go, the higher the spending. The further to the right you go as you look at it is the, uh, the bigger the economy. You notice where that average is. You notice the United States on, per, on a per capita basis is, spends less, the government spends less on a per capita basis than the average for the industrialized economies of the world. The point is that, uh, that um, you can bring those down. Actually, you can, yes, if they're not down. Uh, right now, our taxes are around 16% of our gross domestic product. That would probably be 17 or 18 percent if the economy was in better shape. Uh, in fact, um, 18 percent, around 18 percent, has been the historical average since the end of World War II. Okay, allowing the Bush tax cuts to expire would have expanded, would have raised tax collections by about two and a half percent of gross domestic product, which means it would have been around 21 or maybe even 22 percent of gross domestic product by the end of the decade. The Obama plan, the Senate plan, the House plan, the plan that's passed now, would instead keep taxes at around 18% of gross domestic product. This at a time when, again, government spending is about 23% of gross domestic product. What this means is, and the precise numbers are not really important. The exact details are not important. What it means is that the, that the White House unilaterally and permanently has given away more than 2% of gross domestic product in terms of federal tax revenues. This is all in the name of symbolically taxing the rich and defending the middle class. This agreement would raise taxes slightly on the top 1% of households. Uh, the total would amount to about 0.3% of gross domestic product, while making permanent over 2% in cuts uh, and 2% and of gross domestic product in cuts. This is all to spare us, to spare us, you, me, everybody, from having to pay the same tax rates that we paid 12 years ago. I, again, I'm trying to make sure that you understand what this means. What I'm saying, because I'm throwing numbers around and whatnot. Understand what this means. The deficit is the difference between what you bring in and what you spend. Okay? 
That's, that's simple enough. The White House and Congress together have basically prevented that amount from being more than about 18% of our economy. Even as government is looking to spend 23% of the economy. They actively avoided reducing that difference. And you know, this was the time, if you're going to do that, if you're going to actually increase taxes, if you're actually going to close that deficit, this is the time for doing it. This is the time the White House had leverage and said they gave those revenues up permanently without a fight and without getting anything in return. You know, but that sort of criticism from, from his left uh, only irritates President Hopi Changi and his White House staff. Uh, the staff sniped about armchair criticism. I have no idea what that means. I mean, I'm standing now. I'm, does that mean it's my criticism is, is more valid? I don't know what that means, but never mind. The administration attitude about this was, in essence, how dare you question us instead of just being grateful for whatever crumbs we secured for you. But their defensive whining does not change the fact that the deal that has made makes it impossible to get to tax revenues that are as much as 21 or 22 percent of gross domestic product under any scenario. In fact, it probably can't even get to 19 percent. What does that mean? That is going to mean drastic cuts in, in spending, drastic cuts in public spending, drastic cuts in public support and public programs over the next 10 years. And it's going to happen. I mean, this is going to happen. Uh, the, the Republicans are already saying now, they're already saying that, okay, we've done taxes. That's the deal. We've done taxes. Taxes are off the table. From now on, the whole discussion is spending cuts. The whole discussion is spending cuts. Because remember, this whole business of the, of the sequester, of these, you know, these imposed cuts in spending, comes up again in two months. All they did is put it off for two months. It comes up again. Plus the fact you've got the need to raise the debt ceiling, to pay the bills for the things you've already approved. When the goppers come into this and demand massive spending cuts, what's Obama going to say? What's he going to negotiate with? I mean, how can he say, I'll only give you that if you give me this? He doesn't have any this anymore. He gave it away. On domestic issues, on social needs, already, frankly, Barack Obama looks like a lame duck, and he hasn't even been inaugurated for his second term yet. Oh, but don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. It'll be all fine. It, he, he, it, we'll get him next time. He's going to be tough next time. Oh, yes, he will. He declared he would not negotiate with Republicans over raising the debt ceiling. Just like he would not negotiate about the $250,000 limit. Just like he would not negotiate about uh, continuing the tax cuts a couple of years or last year. Uh, just like any of a dozen other places that any of us could come up with with a little thought. Just like all the other cases, it's, don't worry, we'll get them next time. A next time that I frankly think is not going to come. All right, two footnotes to this. One is that um, the White House used incredibly deceptive arguments in trying to make this deal, get this deal through. Uh, one that particularly ir irritated me was the claim that letting the payroll tax holiday expire, uh, a holiday the White House wanted to continue, would cost the average taxpayer $2,000 a year. Well, since the cut was 2% of earned income, yeah, that would be true if the average taxpayer was earning $100,000 a year. In fact, which is not quite double the actual median household income in the United States. And as it turned out, the, pack, the, the package uh, that was passed would raise taxes by $2,000 if you're making more than about $200,000 a year. All right, but I'm going to leave that aside. Okay, leave that aside for now because I got one other thing. I want to make sure I get this in. Uh, this is our other weekly feature. It's the outrage of the week. The NRA, the Nutsoid Rabbit Brains of America, their latest campaign is to join with manufacturers of gun accessories, because remember, the NRA is basically a lobby for the gun manufacturing. Uh, they're joining with manufacturers of certain gun accessories to campaign to deregulate and promote the use of silencers. 
Yeah, silencers. The thing that we really, really, really want to do, because that's what we really, really, really want to do, is to let people like Adam Lanz to keep the noise down. So maybe it'll be longer before anyone notices there's anything going on. Oh, oh no, no, that has nothing to do with how dare I even think such a thing. Oh, no, no, this is all about concern for, wait for it, the healthy hearing, the, the hearing health, rather, of children. I'm serious. The argument is that the noise of gunfire at a shooting range can damage the hearing of children that are there. And what's worse, the noise can frighten them and make them less likely to want to use guns to shoot targets and people and stuff. Again, I'm serious. Silencers are described by one advocate as good for, quoting, getting younger folks involved in guns. They're less afraid of the loud bang. Now, silencers are now legal with a permit in 40 states, so it's not like they're going to be banned, but they are subject to a federal tax, and the serial number is entered into a federal registry, which, of course, is horrifying because that might keep some people from buying them. So now we're supposed to deregulate, decontrol, and make universally available and untraceable something that in its modern incarnation was invented in 1967 by a former CIA black, black ops operative named Mitch Werbel, who's known in gun cir circles as the Wizard of Whistling Death, who designed it for the conscious and specific use of it being used in assassinations and hit squads. And it's all for the sake of the hearing, comfort, and convenience of recreational shooters who find orange earplugs unsightly. Outrage hardly describes it. All right, one last thing I want to get in real quick. It's only going to take me about a minute. FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, has been reauthorized by the Senate after the, uh, after the Senate rejected three attempts to add oversight and safeguards to the law. The program was created by the Bush administration unilaterally after 9-11. It was retroactively authorized by Congress in 2008. Now, critics have raised fear that law-abiding Americans are being caught in a vast electronic dragnet of electronic data. And civil liberties advocates said that Congress should cut back the program or at the very least have, have more information about how it's being carried out. Instead, in the Senate, we got a string of lopsided bipartisan votes by a body that literally does not want to know what's going on. And the debate was punctuated by fear-mongering. Uh, Dianne Feinstein said that, uh, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, no, we're still under threat. Uh, Senator Saxe Chambliss said, we can't even declassify summaries of what the secret court does. So to a do-nothing Congress, we can add a see-nothing Congress and a know-nothing Congress. That's it. I'm done. I'm out of time. Uh, so I will see you next week. Um, and uh, in the meantime, you have the best week you possibly can. Again, email, send them to me. We'll see you next week. Bye.